so, Lord Jesus, we agree with what Bailey just sang. She sang it better than I did. But uh, what a beautiful name, Yeshua. Yahweh is salvation. And yet, Jesus, i got to admit that at times it's also a bit confusing. So I pray that you would help us to preach, that we preach you, Jesus, or maybe you preach us. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Confusing. Uh, But Lord, we pray you would be glorified in Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hey, um, how many of you have ever felt like, you know, you just got the tar beat out of you by a set of events or circumstances in life, and, and you just didn't know why? You ever had that experience? Right? Yeah? Okay, and, and how many of you ever gone to church at a time like that? Right? Just, just hoping for a, a blessing. You know, thinking if I do what God wants, maybe he'll give me the promotion or fix my marriage or just make life a, a little bit easier. You ever done that? Yeah? Have any of you ever done that and then felt like life didn't get easier? It only got worse. Perhaps even what I would call miracle bad. 1984, I decided to forego a promising career in geology, which had been kind of my dream as a kid, and take my new bride and move to California and pursue a career in ministry I thought, figured God would like that. I still do think that's what he wanted. But I didn't think it'd be so hard. Both cars, crazy stories, broke down on the way there. The bank wouldn't transfer our money. Our contacts, they all fell through. The housing that we'd arranged, it fell apart. When we finally did get a place, it was a complete dump. In like the very worst part of the San Fernando Valley, life was hell. And then this one night, I just heard all this banging, continual banging coming from the apartment directly above ours, and I just kind of finally lost it. I went upstairs, I knocked on the door, and when the door opens, no kidding, there was this like guy there in his underwear speaking some foreign language, I look in and there were like four or five other guys in their underwear. And remember, it's, it's a hot night in Southern California. They're just running around this apartment. There's no furniture in the apartment except for one full drum set in the middle of the floor. And I just remember thinking, God, what the heck? This is like... Not just bad, this is miracle bad. What are the odds of that? And this is a silly example, but all that first year of seminary, it was not just bad, it was miracle bad. I can't tell you how many nights Susan just fell apart in my arms, sobbing and sobbing in that dingy little apartment with the foreign exchange student drummers drumming away directly overhead, miracle bad. 16 years ago, 2007, I remember sitting in my office thinking, oh my gosh, God, this this could really happen. This looks like the perfect storm. And yet, I don't think I've ever been more obedient to you, God, than I have been in the last couple of years, but it looks like this church is about to explode. And it's miracle bad. Not a little bad, miracle bad. And I'm not talking about foreign exchange students in their underwear who won't stop playing the drums on hot nights in Southern California. I'm talking about an entire church ripped apart. My kids losing all their friends and outright demonic and satanic activity. And some people would say, well, that's not God's fault. But like Martin Luther said, even the devil is God's devil. And during that time, God made it clear to me that he was in charge of the whole thing. So I may have been battling against principalities and powers, the world rulers of this present darkness, but in the end, I, I was and always am wrestling God. When I first started preaching, you know, I, I kind of thought, 
My job was like to be a spin doctor for God. And I figured that he'd want to help with that endeavor. You know? But it's hard to put a good spin on a statement like this. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow. And then it gets even harder when St. Paul says stuff like, all things are yours, by the way. All things are yours. So listen closely to what I'm saying. All things are yours. <laughs> Present your bodies a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And, and we're like, um, <laughs> okay, I, I wasn't asking for all things. <laughs> Just a raise. You know, like a little, a little blessing. How about, I, how about I give up chocolates for Lent and you give me that raise? <laughs> Fair deal? Sometimes when things are really tough, I'll get desperate and watch evangelists on late night TV. <laughs> and then I'll find myself wondering, am I even a Christian? Christian's a fine name, except Christians often look so little like like Christ. You know, Christian is a name that we gave ourselves in Antioch. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 11. But in Genesis 32, God himself gives us a name. And that name is Israel. In Romans, we learn that we are Israel by, by marriage and by virtue of the fact that we're grafted in the family tree if we weren't there already, by, by faith through, through grace, the seed of Abraham. That's what we are, offspring of Abraham. There's a country named Israel, but that, if anything, is actually Judah. And Judah is part of Israel, but definitely not all of Israel. Paul refers to us as Israel, the Israel of God. And that means something. So many times I've watched Christian TV and thought something, something's wrong. And then I'll remember that my name is Israel. And then what I thought was wrong turns out to be actually the very thing that's right. And then I'll realize that the name Christian also fits, for it's not only me that wrestles with God. In fact, Christ wrestles with God in, in a garden on my behalf until he finally says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be, be done. You see, Israel means wrestles with God. We find the story in Genesis 32, but it's in Genesis 25 that we begin to read about Jacob, who is predestined to become Israel. Jacob means heel grabber and something like, like cheat. For when Jacob is born, he's grabbing the heel of his older brother Esau, who is the firstborn. And it turns out to be just as uh, God told their mother, Rebekah, while they were still in the womb. God told Rebekah, the older, the firstborn, will serve the younger. Esau is, is red, and, and the name means something like red. It's a play on the word Adam, which means man. And Esau is the proverbial man's man, his father's favorite, Esau. While Jacob is a mama's boy, she's Rebecca's favorite. Quote, a quiet man dwelling in tents. You remember that Jacob extorts Esau, famous story, does it with a bowl of soup in order to obtain the birthright. The birthright was a double share and the inheritance, which was given to the oldest son, the firstborn. Esau may have thought that it was only some tents and servants and camels, but we know, because we're following the story, that it is the promise made to Abraham. Years later, when Isaac is very old, the dad is very old, blind and about to die, Rebekah helps Jacob pretend to be his brother Esau and thereby trick his father, Isaac, into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. Isaac blesses Jacob with the blessing of Abraham, and that's no small blessing. It's the birthright. All the real estate that Abraham was promised, and the blessing that, that in Abraham all would be judged. Remember he said, those whom you bless, I bless, and those whom you curse, I will curse. All would be judged, and 
all the nations of the earth would be blessed. In you will all the nations of the earth be blessed. When Esau finds out about this, what happened with his blind dad and his little brother Jacob, and informs his father Isaac, Isaac is just deeply shaken, but he tells Esau that Jacob had already received the blessing. Esau replies, he was rightly named Jacob because he's cheated me twice. Esau weeps. And Isaac blesses Esau with whatever's left. And then Esau plots to kill Jacob once Isaac is dead. But Rebekah finds out and helps Jacob flee to Paddan Aram, which is in modern-day Iraq. It's on the way there, and while Jacob is still clearly just like a turd of a man, okay, it's on the way there that God gives him the dream, the famous dream of the heaven being opened, heaven and, and a ladder, and angels going up and down uh, the ladder, and then God unconditionally promises to bless him with all the blessings of Abraham. Basically, Jacob learns that he's saved. But we find out he still has to do some wrestling. When he gets to Iraq, Laban cheats him, his uncle Laban. And he pretty much cheats Laban and his wives. This is crazy. They're all in the Bible. They basically cheat each other and their slave girls by making them sleep with their husband Jacob, who bears their babies, and that becomes the nation of Israel. You see, Jacob is still quite a turd of a man, and yet God still blesses him, promises to be with him, and even helps him despoil Laban. Laban, who does not like being despoiled. After 20 years, Jacob flees from Laban, for God promises to go with Jacob and bless Jacob in the promised land. So now Jacob approaches the promised land from the north, and he sends messengers to Esau and Edom in the south. Messengers who then return to Jacob with news that Esau is coming with 400 men. That's an army. He's at the edge of the promised land with Laban behind him, Esau in front of him, nowhere left to go, nowhere left to flee, and he devises a plan, a plan to appease Esau by sending him all these gifts ahead of him. And then he prays the most dangerous prayer. He asks God to save him. And he claims the blessing. Genesis 32, verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female slaves, his 11 sons, and one daughter Dinah, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Now the Jabbok is a stream that empties into the Jordan from the east, which is the edge of the promised land. He took them and set them across the stream and everything else that he had. We don't know why. Perhaps he wanted a buffer between himself and Esau. Perhaps he just wanted to be alone. Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. I strongly suspect that Jacob was having one of those late night anxiety produced devotional quiet times, just like the ones that I seem to have quite often. And so he recited, Jacob recited the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside the still waters. But this night, things felt more like the valley of the shadow of death. And so he read the Footprints poem that he had downloaded from the internet. <laughs> and then he began to sing. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear Falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he... Blammo! Right there! At the start of the third sentence in the refrain, this guy just like out of the darkness just nails him and knocks him to the dust, the, the abak in Hebrew. Like, he knocks him to the abak by the jabak and starts to abak him, which is the word for wrestling in, in Hebrew. At his lowest point, in the middle of the night, when Jacob is calling out to God to send his blessing, blammo, 
unexpected, confusing, passionate, painful, violent wrestling. And not just bad, miracle bad, all night long. And somewhere during that crazy night, Jacob realized this guy isn't just good, he's divine. And maybe he begins to realize perhaps it was this guy that I've been wrestling all alone. Whatever the case, if I'm Jacob, I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time to check out a new religion. <laughs> you ever been there? But at this point, Jacob really can't flee like he has before. Instead, Jacob hangs on. He even prevails. The word can also be translated, he endures. And yet it's clear that the God-man lets him because as the sun rises, the God-man touches Jacob's hip, Yarek in Hebrew, and, and the bone rips right out of the socket. Now, in the book of Genesis, men grab each other by the Yarek, which apparently means what you think it means. It's somewhere in this area. They grab each other by the Yarek to confirm covenants, which makes some sense if you're a guy. Well, this covenant just about kills Jacob. He can no longer run. He can no longer flee. Exhausted, depleted, and defeated, all he can do is cling to this God-man. And you see, Jacob has become aware that this man is God, so all he can do is cling to God and beg him for a blessing. And I'm convinced that's exactly what the God-man wanted. A Jacob who could no longer take the blessing, con his way into the blessing, no longer pretend to deserve the blessing by pretending to be someone that he is not. A Jacob with the self-centeredness, the self-sufficiency, the self-absorption, the self-deception, and the hell just beat right out of him, a clinging, defeated You know, I used to take Susan to scary movies just so she'd cling to me and yearn for me to bless her with my presence. I used to take the kids camping for the exact same reason. And for the exact same reason, they loved to go camping. They'd listen to the wind blowing through the trees outside our tent, hear, hear the wild animals, unidentified wild animals roaming about the woods. They'd feel their own vulnerability. And then they'd snuggle up next to me as I hugged them tight and gave them kisses. But you see, I exposed their weakness. And then I became their strength. And more than anything, especially the boys, they just love to wrestle. Wrestling is like number one on a dad's job description. There was just something about testing their strength, feeling my strength, knowing that I could beat them, and yet I always loved them. There was just something about that that made wrestling their very favorite thing to do. But sometimes... I would wrestle them even when they didn't want to wrestle. My daughter Elizabeth had a particularly wonderful and very strong will. Not recently, but several times in the past, I've heard Christians say something like this. God would never violate your will. And I thought, surely they don't mean that. And if they do, surely they're not talking about the all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign God of Scripture. Surely they don't mean that they get whatever they want whenever they want it, and therefore will, you know, always stay young and never die. How's that working for you? Surely they mean something instead, like God loves you. But if God loves you or even relates to you at all, you have to violate your will. In fact, you constantly violate your own will. Unless you are completely pure of heart, always willing what you want and then wanting what you will. I'm saying that you each have a good will and a bad will, and you're constantly violating one with the other. You, you wrestle yourself constantly, don't you? Self-discipline is your good will, wrestling your bad will into submission. And every good parent will help their child do that wrestling when they can't do it for themselves. For any child 
that's entirely undisciplined becomes a prisoner to their own bad will and unable to even perceive goodwill. If a child always gets whatever they think they want, they can no longer want anything that they get, for they render themselves unable to receive the one thing that they really truly want, and that thing is love. You know, we're all born ignorant of love. We don't know what it is, or I should say he is. If we're true to Scripture, we really ought to replace the doctrine of original sin with the doctrine of original ignorance. For every little Adam, every little man, every little baby is born without the knowledge of good and evil. And that's why we don't blame babies. That baby should have known better. But soon, a baby, a child, gains some knowledge of good and evil. And good parents will help that child will the good because every child is made for the good and so desperately longs for the good even when unaware of that fact about themselves. They don't know what they want. Well, like I was saying, my kids love to wrestle. But sometimes I'd wrestle them when they didn't want to wrestle for they each had their own will. And, and Elizabeth had a particularly wonderful, still does, and, and very strong will, a good will, and sometimes a bad will. <laughs> On four or five occasions when she was about three, she didn't get what she wanted or didn't want what she got, like a doll or a particular piece of candy or something. It kind of didn't matter. And she worked herself into such a frenzy that in order to protect herself from herself, and in order to protect her brother and her, her mother, I'd have to just wrestle her down, kicking and screaming. Three years old, absolutely out of God, to wrestle her down until finally she just passed out and fell asleep. I'd be a basket case. What kind of pastor am I? Lying awake all night long. What kind of... She's, morning, she'd come run into the kitchen. She'd jump on my lap and she'd say, I love you, Daddy. You see, in her rage, she didn't know what she wanted. But what she wanted was me. And John and Mom, we were the blessing. She wanted love. But that's the problem with love. You can't take love, Jacob. You can only receive love because God is love. That's why an undisciplined child who gets whatever they want can never want anything that they get for what they really want is love. And love is not just the gift, but the giver. Not a created thing, but the creator. And that's why wrestling is number one on every good dad's job description. My favorite thing as a child was wrestling my dad. He'd let me win. He'd let me prevail. And then I'd say, Daddy, you're not even trying. And he'd say, you want to see me try? And I'd scream, yes. And then he'd wrestle me down the floor and hug, her, hug me and give me these sloppy white kisses all over my face as I giggled. I have to tell you that the greatest supernatural, miraculous gift that I've ever received was the day that God literally wrestled me to the ground in Toronto, Canada, pinned me to the floor, and I thought, I thought he was actually going to break my arms. I tell people that story, and I just watch the fear come over their faces. And then I have to say something like, oh, no, you, you really, you don't understand it was the greatest experience of my life. He was breaking my arms, but he was simultaneously showing me that he was everywhere all the time, absolutely loving me. And so you see, I, I had asked him, I had asked him repeatedly, Lord, if I'm out of your will, this, I, I, please just break my arms. You understand the thing I fear the most apart from God is not the devil. I know the devil has lost. He's a loser. It's not the devil. It's not taxes. It's not Vladimir Putin and nuclear war. It's my own bad will. 
my own selfishness and insecurity and arrogance and lust. But that day, he showed me that even if I made my bed in hell, he'd find me and wrestle the hell out of me and wrestle his home right out of me. He loves me that much, and he's that good. He is the good and the life, my life. Okay, back to our story. Genesis 32, verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, his, literally his yarrick, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then the man, he said, let me go for the day, the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Now that's a confession, isn't it? I'm the cheat that took the birthright and stole the blessing from the firstborn. I'm Jacob. Verse 28, then he, the God-man, said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven, Sarah, struggled, wrestled with God, with men, and have prevailed. You have endured. That's a pretty good definition of any healthy relationship, isn't it? You have wrestled and endured. You didn't cheat, you didn't flee, you didn't quit, you wrestled and endured. All of those whom I love the most are those with whom I've wrestled the most and we've endured. In high school, it was literally some friends with whom I wrestled. I mean, tackle football after church, wedgie wars after church, charlie horse wars at the movie theater until I literally couldn't walk without limping. But, you know, people often flee as soon as the wrestling starts. And so they remain alone. But to wrestle and endure, that's the definition of a great friendship. That's the definition of a great small group or a church. That's the definition of marriage. Every weekday at 2 p.m. in Gehring, Nebraska, Martha Gertson lowers the shades, disconnects the phone, and turns on the TV. Martha and Chris Gerrick, Gertson, Martha and Chris, they, they watch all-star wrestling. That when she gets sufficiently worked up, she throws a step-over toehold on her husband. Then it begins. In the living room, they try to pin each other in front of the TV. Martha says, those romantic soap operas are fake, but the wrestling is real. According to Paul Harvey News, Paul Harvey, Paul Harvey News, Martha usually wins, but Martha Gertson is only 76. Husband Chris is 82. Or at least he was when I heard that story. You probably know that the church is called the Bride of Christ. But you may not realize that according to Scripture, specifically Isaiah and Hosea, Israel is the bride of God, a harlot that becomes his bride. Well, I'm here to tell you those romantic soap operas that you often see on Christian TV, they're, they're oftentimes fake. But the wrestling's real. So when times are tough and you think this isn't just bad, this is miracle bad, don't give up on Jesus. Your name is Israel. It means God wrestler or even wrestler God. God wrestles you in several ways. Number one, he wrestles you with circumstances. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, absolutely sovereign. He isn't evil, but he does arrange for you to encounter evil and even consigns you to disobedience, which is evil, that you might know mercy, which is good. So he wrestles you with circumstances. Number two, he wrestles you with... Jacob not only wrestles with the circumstances that are all around him, but the word that's been spoken into him. We're going to talk about that more next, next week. 
And three, God wrestles you with the God man. <laughs> so who's the God man? Verse 28, the God man said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have endured. You have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. Notice that there's no mention of any words. Maybe he is the word. Maybe he is the blessing. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Peniel or Penuel. It comes from two Hebrew words, Pana, which means turn and look, and El, which uh, means God. It's as if Jacob had been running from God his entire life, but at Peniel, God turned Jacob's face to face himself. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered, saved. You see, that's utterly fascinating, because it seems that the sun had risen upon the face of the God-man, the face, of, the face of, of God, the man who is God. And as God makes clear to Moses, no one can see my face and live. Which clearly implies that Jacob had not been saved from death, but he had been saved through death. As if he died and rose with the God-man. In other words, he lost his psyche and found it for the sake of the God-man. No longer Jacob, but now Israel. To come face to face with the God-man is to lose your life and find it. Verse 31, the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, or Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that's on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the sinew of the thigh. Next verse. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, check this out, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female slaves, and he put the servants, the slaves, with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself now he was behind them, now he goes on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came to his brother. But Esau, the firstborn, ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Renowned evangelical Bible scholar D.A. Carson points out that clearly Jesus seems to have like drawn on this story when telling the story of the prodigal son, which means that Jesus would be comparing God the Father or himself to Esau. And that makes complete sense in light of what Jacob says next. So listen to this. In verses 5 through 7, Esau asked Jacob about his family, right, which is the Israelites, and why Jacob sent all the presents and everything on before. Jacob answers to find grace, to find favor, to purchase grace in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please, if I have found grace, favor in your sight, then accept my present. It's a present from my hand. For now, I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God. And you have accepted me. Wow. Did you get that? Jacob, that is Israel, just told Esau that he looked like God. And he had just wrestled the God-man as the sun dawned upon his face a new day. Ancient rabbis really struggle with this story. And we really, really struggle with this story. I have so much respect for the Bible because clearly this is not like the kind of story that religious people would write. The rabbis struggled with the story because they couldn't believe that a man like Jacob could ever appear to prevail against God. And so they would argue that the God man really wasn't God. It was like a, you know, a sub-angel messenger kind of deal going on there. But, but the text clearly says, God, 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 God that's a man and a man that's a God. Can you even conceive of a man that's God? A God that's, that's man? 
and a moment in which it appeared that normal humans, I mean mankind, or more specifically Israel, uh, prevailed against that God-man, and yet that God-man blessed Israel and all the nations of the world. And the rabbis really struggled, and we struggled because Jacob Israel said to Esau, you, Esau, look like the God-man. The rabbis hated Esau, which was the country of Edom. They became Edom. And, and Christians, they know that the God-man is Jesus. So Esau looked like Jesus? Jesus who is what? Firstborn of all creation. Firstborn from the dead. Now think, why did we crucify Jesus? Scripture's pretty clear on this. We were jealous. We wanted his birthright and blessing. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The perfect image of the invisible God. We've all tried to purchase his birthright with soup or whatever our hands can produce. We've all tried to fool the Father into blessing us by pretending to be the firstborn. And we all took his life on the tree in the garden trying to become him because he's the perfect man. The eschatos Adam, the Superman. I mean, it's all so obvious. And yet we all struggle with the idea that Jesus looks like Esau because of this prophecy in Malachi 1 that's quoted by Paul in Romans 9, which we spent a long time studying. It goes like this. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you, Israel, say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, I have loved the cheat, but Esau I have hated. Not hate, but have hated. Perfect tense, as if, as in it is accomplished, finished. We struggle with that. And so we reply, well, God is love. So how could love hate anyone? I suppose that part of our problem is semantics, but God doesn't just hate someone like Esau. According to Scripture, God hates everyone, like Jacob. And apparently, you. I didn't write the Bible. Psalm 5.5. 5. You, O Lord, hate all evildoers. Did you ever meet someone that did evil? Hosea 9.15, speaking of Israel, his bride, who had made herself once again a whore. God says, therefore, at Gilgal, that's the first place that Israel camps on entering the promised land, the nation of Israel. At Gilgal, there, I began to hate them. Isn't it how we make a big deal out of God having hated Esau when clearly he hated Jacob as well? Jeremiah 12, 8, I hate her. Who? Jeremiah 12, 7, my beloved. <laughs> God hates all evildoers. That is his beloved, his beloved evildoers. And now you may say, well, Jesus never did any evil. When did God ever hate Jesus? And God, as Paul says, was in Christ and is in Christ. So that's asking the question, when did God ever hate God? When did God ever wrestle with God? You remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane as he sweat great drops of blood? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. As we preached in Romans, in that garden, God in Christ Jesus gave us his will. His good will. And he bore our bad will. He descended into us to bear the pain of our bad will and give us his good will. He descended into us to help us surrender our bad will, even as we receive God's good will. In the garden, he descended into man to help us wrestle 
with himself. God. He is the good free will of God in you. What is that good in you? That's God in you. He is love wrestled into you and wrestling for you against the old you. I think, and and language is a problem here, but I, I think he only hates you because he cannot stop loving you, and you are your own worst enemy. Okay, and now the story really gets trippy, so put your thinking caps on. It really gets trippy for not only had the birthright and blessing belonged to Esau, the firstborn, who looks like Jesus, while we look like Jacob, which means that we are like twins in the womb with Jesus and the older will serve the younger because that is who God is. God is relentless, sacrificial love. It gets trippy for not only had the birthright and blessing belonged to Esau, who looks like Jesus, now the birthright and blessing belongs to Jacob, and is even in Jacob. For as we know, the birthright and blessing is the promised seed in Greek, sperma. The blessing is Jacob's great, 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 super great grandson, Jesus. So do you see that when Jacob wrestled Jesus, the God-man at the edge of the promised land, remember there was a, Some guy with a flaming sword at the edge of it when we last read about it. So do you see that when Jacob wrestled Jesus at the edge of the promised land, he was wrestling his own blessing? For the blessing always wanted to bless bless Jacob far more than Jacob could even conceive of being blessed. Now check out Genesis 35, verses 9 through 11. God appeared to Jacob again, when he came from Paddan Aram, Iraq, and blessed him, and God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> that should sound familiar. Do you understand? Jacob, Israel is us. He is old Adam, transformed into the new Adam, the eschatos Adam, because he wrestled the God-man at the edge of the promised land, which is the location of the Garden of Eden. Adam is coming home. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden, which becomes a city that is a harlot, which is then transformed into the bride, New Jerusalem, for in the heart of the city there's a garden, and in the garden a tree, the tree of life, for the healing of the nations. And do you see what's hanging on that tree? The blessing. (laughs) Sorry to yell. It just gets me all worked up. The life, eternal life, and the good, everything you could possibly want, the good in a body of flesh hanging there like fruit on a tree. You know, I used to just absolutely hate that hymn in the garden. But now it's my favorite. This week I learned that it was written by a pharmacist in 1935 who was reading the Gospel of John in his basement somewhere in Pennsylvania when he had a vision. John 19, 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb. When he got to John 20, verses 1 through 18, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. He had a a vision. As he read the story, he became Mary, the harlot, like us, who becomes who she truly is, the bride of Christ. I come to the garden alone. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. See, he's talking about the garden on Mount Calvary with the cross in its midst. And he's talking about the garden of Eden on the holy mountain of God with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in its midst. 
And he's talking about the garden city of the New Jerusalem on Mount Zion with the tree of life in the very same place. And he's even talking about the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of that very same mountain where Jesus joins us on the way up. And now I know that we'd all love to experience the blessing of Easter morning in the way that Mary Magdalene experienced it on Easter in that garden long ago. But now let me ask you, did she experience some wrestling on the way up? Yeah. Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. (laughs) She had most likely lived most of her life as a harlot. It had been miracle bad. And now let me just suggest an idea. At the start of this message, you all appeared to indicate that you had felt pretty beat up at times. And sometimes, like, maybe even it was miracle bad. Maybe it's all miracle bad. Maybe God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, which means that all bad is miracle bad. Which, in reality, is miracle good. Maybe, just maybe, all things work together for the good. For all things are called according to his purpose. God is not evil. Jesus is no demon. And yet they allow us to wrestle with those things. And sometimes we see that it's Jesus himself that we, in fact, are actually wrestling as if we ourselves have become the demonic and the evil. And why would God ever allow for such a thing? As that. Well, maybe your story is Mary's story. And Mary's story is Jacob's story. And Jacob's story is Adam's story. And miracle of miracles, God has made Adam's story his own story. So take a look at that tree in the middle of the garden. Maybe we all begin our life in the garden. In other words, we're born ignorant into a little spot surrounded by a whole bunch of evil, into a world of sin. Maybe we're born ignorant into a world of sin, but that's not original sin. That's original ignorance, which leads us to sin. For we each look to the tree. It grows in the sanctuary of every human heart, and it grows all around us. We each look to the tree and see that it's good for food, a delight to the eyes of desire to make one wise. In other words, we see the good and uh, the life. In other words, we see the blessing. And so we attempt to take the blessing, we take the good, the birthright of the firstborn, we take the life, who is the firstborn, the blessing. In other words, we sin. I don't think God's surprised by that. (laughs) We take the life thinking it's our life and everything dies. We take the good and we come to know the evil. And then what do we do? our country, terrified of the very blessing that we most earnestly desire. But the God-man in whom all things are created and sustained, he finds us and he wrestles us through all the circumstances of our life. He wrestles us with his words spoken into us and implanted within us. He wrestles us back to the garden. He wrestles with us, even in us and for us in the garden until with him we pray, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit because... I want to. That's what every father longs to hear. Dad, I'm home because I want to be home. Do you realize that God wants to give you the blessing far more than you ever could ever possibly have wanted to take the blessing? But you cannot receive the blessing if you're under the illusion that you have stolen the blessing, (laughs) earned the blessing, created the blessing, or obtained the blessing by anything other than absolute grace. God himself is the blessing. And all things, all things are your birthright. But to inherit all things, you can no longer believe that you earned anything. 
To know the Creator, you can no longer pretend to be the Creator. And to be the bride of Jesus, you have to surrender Mises. For although Jesus will wrestle the hell out of you, he refuses to violate your heart. So do you see, Jacob? He lets you prevail. Every time you sin, you prevail. He lets you prevail, but he will not stop wrestling until you plead for mercy. He lets you win in order that he might win your heart. This is a mystery, but he himself is your new heart. He is goodwill imprisoned in your bad will. He's the promised seed of Abraham, your birthright and your blessing, and he is no small blessing. 30-some years ago, I read the following story in the San Francisco Chronicle as I was drinking my morning coffee in, in Danville. 53-year-old Giuseppe Panisi and his crew were netting rock cod and sole about 40 miles southwest of San Francisco on their 81-foot uh, commercial fishing vessel, the Diana. It was their livelihood. They were fishing for a blessing, trying to snag a blessing out of the abyss. It had been a normal day, tranquil day, when all at once, blammo, out of nowhere, the two five-eighths-inch steel cables that held Diana's 7,000 pounds of fishing net, they, they lost all slack, and suddenly they were being pulled back out to sea. As the winches began slipping, Giuseppe shut down the powerful engines on the Diana, but they were still being dragged at about five knots, six miles an hour, backwards out into the ocean. Bubbles started coming up all around the boat. One of the steel cables snapped like it was a rubber band. At this point, they knew whatever they were wrestling had the power to drag them into the abyss. And in desperation and terror, Giuseppe frantically called the Coast Guard, and then psh, all at once, the struggle stopped. And this is the scene that I would just die to see. These old fishermen looking over the side of their boats to see what they had caught in their nets, when suddenly, out of the depths, right next to their boat, longer than a football field, displacing 6,500 tons of water, rises the USS Parch. <laughs> Nuclear attack submarine. Most decorated submarine in U.S. naval history, loaded with warheads, capable of starting World War III, a virtual Armageddon machine. <laughs> it was the catch of the day. Or maybe Giuseppe Panisi was the catch of the day. On the sixth day, the sixth day of the week, the night he was betrayed, and it seemed as if the children of Adam had prevailed against the God-man. The God-man took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is not a small blessing. This is an Armageddon machine. Uh, this will cause you to lose your psyche, your view of reality, and find it. This will annihilate your bad will, and he is your good will. This little bit of faith is the presence of God. A little bit of faith, the presence of God, and the door to the age to come, the promised land. Now, don't be surprised if you experience a little wrestling. <laughs> Nothing's wrong. Actually, everything is right. 
So don't cut bait. Don't run. Don't flee. Don't hide. Hang in there. And thank God for the blessing. Your name is Israel. So Jesus, go ahead and you pray this with me. Bless us. Amen. The dark cups are wine and the blue cups are juice. So, Lord God, Scripture says that fear is the beginning of wisdom. And then we discover that wisdom is actually a God-man, and he is also perfect love. And then your word tells us that perfect love casts out fear. So, Lord Jesus, I thank you that it's you in the end that we're wrestling with. And you not, we will not leave us alone until we're at home in the kingdom of our Father. And so, Lord Jesus, forgive us for freaking out. I thank you that you do. And we, Lord Jesus, we want to say thank you that you are faithful. And we thank you that you are making us faithful in your image, the perfect image of the invisible God. That's good news. Amen. So, um, <laughs> when we talk about stuff like this, it's funny how people react, but it looks like we're just getting the snot kicked out of us. I mean, look around. Just look around. People did not look like this 20 years ago. Did you, these very same people did not look like this 20, <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't think we have any. Do we have anybody under 20 in here? But, but it's obvious some's kicking the snot out of us, right? And, and um, well, that's not bad news. Uh, you know, if I was, if suddenly in the dark, someone jumped me and started wrestling with me, beating the tar out of me, and then the sun rose, and I turned around and discovered that it was my dad, oh, I had a great dad. That would be the best possible news I could think of. And then he would tell me something, tell me like, oh, Peter, I love you so much. Welcome home. I'm giving you myself, and I'm giving all things with you. Do you understand that you have a very, very, very good dad? And he's not going to quit. He's not going to quit till you're home. So as soon as possible, just say, oh, God, just bless me. And then thank him in, in Jesus' name. In other words, just believe the gospel. Okay? Amen.